We're now going to move to our panel on the DCEP initiative. This is the Digital Currency Electronic Payment Initiative by the People's Republic of China. The panel is being moderated by Joshua James of the San Diego Blockchain Forum. Joining Joshua is Professor Michael Sung, one of the co-founders and co-director of the new Fanhai Fintech Study Center at Fudan University in Shanghai in the People's Republic. Joining Michael will be Dr. Henry Arslanian, head of the blockchain practice at PricewaterhouseCoopers in Hong Kong. And finally, joining the panel is Professor Douglas Arner, one of the leading lights on the DCEP and generally digital currencies that are backed by central banks. Uh, Douglas Arner is a professor at Hong Kong University. The panel will be looking at the new National Digital Currency Project from the People's Republic, which is very different than some of the other dozens that are being tested right around the world. And if you read some of the reports from the Bank of International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks in Bern, Switzerland, you'll see that a central bank digital currency is defined by the BCS as a digital form of central bank money that's different from balances in traditional reserve or settlement accounts. And through its various studies, the BIS has uh, found four motivating factors about about why countries consider implementing a central bank digital currency. The first is interest in technological technological innovations for the financial sector, the second being the emergence of new entrants into payment services and intermediation, the third being declining use of cash in many countries, and finally, a in increasing attention to so-called private digital tokens. And uh, in January of this year, the BIS released a follow-up report to its 2018 report, which discussed trends in the initial report and uh, pretty much uh, confirmed that there are 66 central banks uh, that are in uh, some form of uh, developing uh, a central bank digital currency. And we're seeing Amazing projects that have uh, just emerged in, in the last year, uh, whether it's uh, from um, the Marshall Islands with the SOV or, uh, as I mentioned before, the People's Republic of China with the DCEP. We're seeing them with a digital uh, krona in uh, Sweden and really right around the world. And as of... Um, October 28th of 2018, which henceforth will be known as Blockchain Day in China, uh, Shenzhen and Suzhou were selected to be the first cities to be experimentation sites for the new central bank uh, digital currency that China is piloting. There are four banks involved in preparing the system integration with the People's uh, Bank of China, and they follow uh, more specific procedures as it moves along. And there's a commercial piece to all of this that Michael's going to talk about, and that's the blockchain-based service network, the BSN. It's incredibly important as more and more industry players uh, layer their operations on and glean data, data from this exciting new initiative. Um, and if you uh, are interested, there is a blog on the uh, unitized.online website that uh, will provide a series of papers that some of our speakers have uh, prepared. In fact, uh, it just recently, um, uh, Douglas Arner and his colleagues have published a wonderful paper on the DCEP called After Libra, the Digital Yuan and the COVID-19. And that's on the Social Sciences uh, Research Network. Again, please go to the blog and you'll be able to see some of these uh, these pieces. Likewise, uh, Henry Arslanian has a, a wonderful new book uh, out with a colleague um, on uh, uh, digital currencies and cryptocurrencies in general. And uh, Michael Sung um, also has written uh, uh, extensively, and you'll see a link to a, a recent Coindesk uh, piece that he, uh, he wrote uh, for uh, the DCEP. So without further ado, I uh, turn this over to Joshua James, and thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Josh James, and I'm representing San Diego Blockchain Forum for Unitized, Decentralized, DCEP panel. And I'm joined with some of the biggest and brightest minds in the space when it comes to fintech and global finance. Uh, and I would love to have them be able to introduce themselves. So we'll start with you, Douglas. 
Hey, Jamie, great to, uh, uh, to Josh, Josh, uh, great to be here today with all of you to, to talk about this subject. I think we all agree that going forward, this is going to be uh, a real game changer. Uh, as Josh said, my name is Douglas Arner. Uh, I'm the director of the Asian Institute of International Financial Law uh, at the University of Hong Kong, uh, and I specialize in the intersection of uh, law, finance, and technology, and in this subject, geopolitics. Hi, my name is Michael Song. I'm the co-director of the Fudan Fanahai FinTech Research Center, focused a lot on uh, uh, crossing the bridge of bringing a lot of international innovation into the China ecosystem. And we are looking at a lot of the policy uh, recommendations. I sit on also a, a, a national think tank called the China Institute of Economics and Finance, and we're providing policy recommendations to the central government on things like finance, innovation, liberalization, and fintech. Excellent, uh, guys. First of all, very excited to be here, and thanks for allowing us the, the opportunity to share our passion of, of the topic. My name is Henry Arslan, and, and really my passion and my focus in life is the future of finance and money. And I'm very lucky to be able to do this at the PwC, uh, where I'm a partner and I run our uh, crypto practice globally. Uh, you know, uh, and then uh, I'm also very lucky to do this in my academic capacity as well, where I'm a junk associate professor at the University of Hong Kong, where I've been teaching the first fintech course in Asia for the past uh, for the first, uh, past five years, but also in my author capacity as well, where I published books, my last one being The Future of Finance, the next one being The Future of Money, and last but not least is actually in my uh, kind of advocacy and social media capabilities. You can see here with my fintech capsule and crypto capsule weekly shows, which summarize in 60 seconds the global crypto trends you need to know, and my newsletter called The Future of Money that highlights the big topics on the future of money. You need to know all of it on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again for uh, being able to lend your expertise and your ideas towards this topic. Very hot topic right now, globally. Um, the, the news every week seems to either be something about China's central bank digital currency or DCEP uh, or something coming out of the Federal Reserve. We have a lot of, a lot of talk around sovereign uh, issue to digital assets. Um, so the first thing I want to kind of talk about is, um, Michael, from your perspective, what is China's central bank digital currency? And, and what is the strategy in issuing it so publicly uh, in, in 2020? Yeah, so actually, uh, so this DCEP, the Digital Currency Electronic Payment, has been a thing since, uh, I would say, in 2014, right? Uh, basically, the Chinese central government had already uh, been starting researching it. And the PBOC, which is the People's Bank of China, has since then become uh, essentially the largest patenter of digital currency blockchain related uh, patents in the space so they, they were taking it quite seriously uh, from the beginning um, I think there was a watershed moment uh, last May when Libra announced uh, their uh, or Facebook announced their Libra uh, uh, cur currency right that made shockwaves through the world you saw the uh, knee-jerk reaction from European and American uh, regulators uh, basically uh, you know when that happened the, uh, there was a digital currency institute that was set up in, in China, uh, with which this was being uh, uh, researched. Ma, Ma Tun Tun, who was the uh, head of that and kind of like the uh, shepherd of the uh, digital currency strategy, rushed back to Beijing, uh, convened a emergency workshop with uh, a lot of officials and uh, decided to get ahead of it, right? Uh, the cattle's out of the bag. You no, know, I think uh, prior to this, if you looked in Davos and, you know, some of these uh, uh, ecosystems, nobody talked about digital currencies. It was kind of uh, uh, verboten, right? And, and nobody, uh, they just felt that it was just extreme. But now with Facebook, with this, uh, billions of users coming online, uh, potentially disrupting the international monetary system, uh, uh, the, the Chinese government decided to get ahead of this. So in late November uh, of last year, 2019, uh, Xi Jinping at what we call the fourth plenary sessions which is one of the uh, important meetups for uh, you know the central government announced two major things. One was the official uh, launch of the DCEP itself, and the second was China's uh, national blockchain strategy. Uh, both were uh, quite uh, you know hugely uh, received. Right, a Bitcoin spiked. Uh, I want to say something like uh, 40, 50 percent overnight. We got uh, crypto uh, enthusiasts. Now, uh, you know, praising Xi Jinping, a very rare event, you know, having sort of the libertarians of the world, the Bitcoin maximalists say something nice about Xi Jinping, uh, because, of course, that 
pushes uh, digital uh, uh, assets uh, uh, agenda quite quite hugely, having essentially a sovereign nation and arguably the largest economy by PPP uh, doing this kind of thing. So, um, so I think that's uh, really where where it's at. Absolutely, and and uh, I know that the I know you mentioned Libra, Michael, and I'm and I'm wondering if if Douglas, maybe you can take an angle as to why China would want to get ahead of conversations being held in the West, to sp specifically by a private company that works with social networking. See that as a threat um, potentially, and and are trying to control that conversation um, in in spite of those conversations starting in the US with a, with Facebook's Libra project. You know, I think I think Michael's exactly right when we look at this and we think of um, my team has looked a lot at this and, and we really highlight that the launch of Libra was a watershed moment for central bank digital currencies everywhere, not just in China. I mean, really, lots of central banks have been doing block 2019, but they were all sort of pilot experiments, see how it works, how can we use this, how can we use that. The ones that had sort of moved forward with digital currencies, generally speaking, uh, were not major central banks. But with the announcement of the Libra project, this really changed everything from the global central bank perspective. This really highlighted the fact that there was the potential for a private company to come in and basically displace the central function of central banks in sovereign economies with uh, a tech alternative. And so it really advanced the discussion everywhere and we we see almost immediately uh the convening of uh, a g7 group to look into this a follow-up from the g20 from the financial stability board and what we've seen from surveys from the bis in other words and others is a dramatic increase in the seriousness in central banks everywhere around the world looking at central bank digital currencies and i think if we think of the chinese context because of uh, the role that the, play state, the state plays in the development of the economy, this would be seen as a very natural sort of threat. But it was also seen this way otherwise. And so we would actually highlight that the next step, the announcement in first October and then formalized in November uh, about the, the digital yuan was essentially a next pressure to central banks around the world to take things up. But I think it's important when we look at the Chinese project to realize that, you know, it has these international factors, that it has the sort of geopolitical factors, but it's also a lot of domestic factors that are driving this. And if we think of this, one of those factors uh, is really around uh, the central bank having a better picture of what is going on in the economy, the payment system. It's also about linking together China's various payment systems, its alternative payments, its traditional payment systems in something that is much more sort of manageable. It's about enhancing surveillance. And I think as Michael highlighted, it's about taking forward the tech innovation agenda as well. In other words, if you combine a central bank digital currency with a national blockchain system, that brings together really two of our key pieces that in most places have been a real challenge. And that potentially gives the ideal platform for taking forward other sorts of blockchain projects to su support a variety of tech innovation. And of course, finally, it does potentially together begin to build a platform which could be used to internationalize to a greater extent the RMB or at least operate separate from other sorts of Western dollar-based systems. So I think when we look at the Chinese project, we have to realize that it's domestic factors that dominate, but the catalyst, the accelerant, really was this Libra announcement. And it was the Libra announcement and the Chinese announcement that is catalyzing a lot of others going forward. Absolutely. And I, th I think you brought up the, the key phrase when all this is, and it's payments and, it, and it's global payments. Um, and a lot of these governments and economies are looking at remittances specifically, how labor moving across borders, translating to economic impact is meaningful for their projections. And, uh, and I think we're starting to see some of these digital asset uh, payment companies starting to talk with governments and central banks in a, in a little bit more um, 
honest capacity than maybe 2016 to 2018, where it was almost anti antagonistic to banking. We were de dealing with a lot of KYC and AML issues at the time, which I think expedited this, this need for a standardized messaging type of uh, movement globally. So, so Henry, I know you come from a fintech background. Is there anything that you can kind of talk about in terms of the importance of standardized messaging with payments? Uh, it's an excellent point. And just, uh, just on your point, Josh, you just mentioned, I think you, spit, you hit it spot on, right? So even if we look globally right now, right, at, at a country level, within a certain country, normally payment systems may not be perfect, but they work okay. You know, uh, other, you have systems like in China, you have Alipay and, and WeChat Pay, or within the, the central bank system, what we call RTGS systems and the likes, where, it, it's, again, it's not perfect, but it works okay. The problem is exactly on the point you mentioned, which is the cross-border level, the remittance level. But just to give you an example today, uh, the average cost of cross-border payments is around 7%. And this is actually quite material because you have over 250 million migrants sending around $500 billion a year. And obviously, you can imagine it's often the ones who can afford the least who are paying the highest fees on, on this perspective. And in many emerging markets, the, the percentage is obviously way higher than 7%. So I think that's a kind of, that's a direct problem that um, not only uh, many central bank digital currency initiatives are trying to address, but frankly, that's what Libra is really trying to address as well. And I think when you look at it on a more um, a holistic perspective, and a bit what uh, Douglas mentioned as well, if you're a central banker and you love Bitcoin, I mean, you, you're crazy. Right? It's a bit like a taxi driver being excited to see Uber come in their market. Right? Uh, but of course, what happened over the last couple of years, a lot of central banks realized that there's a lot of actually particularities that they can be using themselves. Uh, and uh, to, a lot of these discussions were happening. Libra, as Douglas and Michael mentioned, really catalyzes. And I always say, kind of half-jokingly, that everybody in this ecosystem, we should send a bouquet of flowers to Mark Zuckerberg to thank him for bringing this conversation on top of the agenda of policymakers around the world. Uh, but also there's a lot of, I think, the benefits that we need to think about, right? And not only, um, uh, first of all, uh, all the CBDC conversations uh, have evolved. You know, two, three years ago, a lot of, it, for the last two years, even until recently, a lot of the conversation around CBDC was around what we call wholesale CBDC. Mm. which is between the central banks and the different uh, member banks or financial institutions are involved in. That's great. Is it really a game changer? Probably less not because it doesn't impact people on a day-to-day -day basis. Where now with Libra and obviously DCP in China has really moved the conversation is on retail CBDC. And in retail CBDC, there's different kinds of retail CBDC, and that's where the fintech companies can come in. For example, there is a two-tiered system, which is where you issue these central bank digital currencies by existing banks or financial systems, if you want. Uh, Sweden is a good example in their latest proposal in 2020 uh, is proposing that. China as well, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a couple of minutes as well. Uh, the digital dollar in the US that uh, former CFTC chairman Chris Giancarlo is putting forward has a variant of that as well. The second one, this, so that's the first category. The second one is what we call the uh, synthetic CBDC, which is actually uh, put forward by Christian uh, uh, Lagarde in the IMF uh, last about a, a bit more than a year ago now, where they really, it's kind of a stable coin but where the stablecoin issuer kind of has access to a central bank reserve, a bit like a bank. Uh, and there's a number of benefits that we can talk about this. And the third model, which is probably very interesting for fintech companies, is what we call the platform model, uh, which was um, initially brought forward by the Swedish in around 2018, uh, the, the Swedish central bank. And probably now the, uh, the, 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 the Bank of England really brought this forward with a tech platform model. And the, the Dutch as well, a couple of weeks ago, put this forward as well, which is kind of a, where central bank puts forward a technology infrastructure with standards, with API calls, and everything you just mentioned, Josh. And then um, banks, but also non-banks, fintechs can plug in. And that's very exciting because it can really transform and, and kind of creates a level playing field to a certain extent between not only financial institutions, but also by um, uh, non-bank fintechs. And that's not only beneficial for the financial industry uh, more broadly, but also most importantly for the users of financial services that includes uh, many of your viewers and most people around the world. Absolutely. Uh, spot on. Michael, I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit about Libra. We've talked about why payments are important and standardized messaging are important around the world. Is China sharing those types of beliefs and thoughts? Are they looking for a different strategic advantage or is, is payments the focal point, um, both domestic and abroad, for DCEP? Well, I, I think uh, they're holding their long-term strategic cards close to the chest, so we can only uh, imagine what the, the, the long-term strategy is, uh, some of these considerations that you allude to. Certainly what's been announced has been a more modest form of things. Uh, basically, the idea here is that it's going to replace the M0 money supply. So they're not trying to disrupt the whole system, you know, SWIFT for 
you know, uh, major large scale uh, money transfers, uh, uh, you know, cross border is still going to be the dominant play. Uh, they're interested in basically replacing cash. Right, digital cash, right? So, uh, you know, very small ticket SME, you know, settlement type stuff, uh, and, and they're they're already going to test beds now. Uh, notably, in a handful of cities like Shenzhen and Chongan, uh, you know, some of the big multinationals such as Starbucks and, uh, and, and McDonald's now have digital wallets, which can uh, receive their fiat backed uh, digital currency. Uh, so they're in test beds, right? When they will actually go and scale that to larger deployments remains to be seen. Uh, but certainly, I think from my perspective, uh, there is a international strategy here, right? Um, China has uh, this Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's 150 countries, two thirds of the world's population, one third of global GDP. Uh, and in, importantly, it's most of the developing areas in the world, right? Anything prior to COVID growing at over a few percent uh, a year G GDP growth, they're a Belt and Road uh, nation. And so um, strategically, uh, to provide connectivity, uh, what we call the digital Silk Road, uh, with the blockchain infrastructure is one aspect of that. Uh, but where you know, where, whereas before they're building a bunch of infrastructure, right? They spent uh, you know upwards of you know a trillion dollars on you know laying out uh, high speed rail and ports and stuff like that. Uh, but where are you going to lay high speed rail? You're going to lay down telecom infrastructure and you're going to light up the world. And that's going to provide you know the last 1.2 billion which has been excluded from the financial ecosystem. Now, if you give them digital wallets uh, and they can do cross-border payments and uh, it's going to facilitate trade, especially in this sort of post-COVID environment where you have uh, fragile SMEs in a lot of these developing worlds, to give them the digital economy tools to latch on to, uh, uh, to, to the rest of the world and to be able to have the financial inclusion to do banking type services, but without the need for a bank, this is going to be huge in the development of these uh, uh, digital economies of, of the future, and uh, China will have a very strategic role in that. Absolutely. I completely agree. I think the, uh, those unbanked or underbanked populations around the world are, are going to see access and inclusivity to some of these tools that I think were pipe dreams maybe five, ten years ago uh, without massive infrastructure spending, and I, and I think China all, already sees the potential with that. Um, Professor Arner, do you have an opinion on some of the benefits of increasing the speed of settlement for transactions and payments or, or what are some of the inherent um i guess uh benefits of such a system and why is it being proposed now and why is it being rolled out so rapidly Bank banks don't necessarily love to be on the bleeding edge of technology so so what is special about this type of faster payment system that really has them excited i mean i think i think there's the number of things that i want to pick up from from that question and also from from what Michael and Henry have said. And the first is this idea that when we're thinking of um, China's central bank digital currency, we're thinking about other central bank digital currencies. Um, we're really looking at the specific situation of each individual country, each individual financial system. In other words, there are a variety of different ways that we can design systems, and those systems can be designed to achieve different sorts of things. Now, if we think of it from the standpoint uh, of quite a lot of developing countries, one thing that they may not have is a well-functioning domestic payment system. So if you're in an environment where you don't have a well-functioning domestic payment system, focusing on a central bank digital currency system that is essentially a mechanism to put in place an effective interoperable national payment system makes a great deal of sense. If you are something like uh, the EU with the single uh, European payments area, or if you think of China with its existing electronic payment systems, you know these are already very sophisticated electronic payment systems. What you don't necessarily need is to replace those. You want to put something together that supports or brings them together. And I think if we look at the Libra point, we think of this idea that, of course, Facebook initially highlighted, and still does, the sort of remittances financial inclusion angle. But there was a lot of skepticism. But I think increasingly what we're seeing are discussions amongst the private sector and public sector about how can we actually use technology to achieve those objectives of reducing remittance costs and increasing financial inclusion. So if we are thinking about faster payment systems, if we're thinking about payment systems, they have 
really the potential to link parts of the economy together in a way that has not happened before. This was the transformative potential of Alipay or WeChat Pay or UPI in India or the single European payments area, but also from a local but also a cross-border standpoint, depending on the design, they may have the possibility of reducing costs for users. Now, if you are able to do these things, what they allow you to do is bring a lot more people into the financial system at a lower cost, which benefits those individuals, it benefits the wider societies, but it also creates new business opportunities. So when we think about payment systems, payment systems are the blood of any financial system in the economy. And so when we are looking at designing, using technology to make those better, we start by looking at the domestic or the international system to figure out where the problems are. But the reality is that increasingly the technology is there to solve many of these problems. And I find that incredibly exciting. Absolutely agreed. Henry, I know, again, the, the, the banking angle for why distributed technology is so exciting is definitely solidified in payments. But is, are there any other avenues that you see excitement coming from uh, you know, traditional uh, fintech, maybe money servicing businesses that are doing things in a different way that banks are noticing and, and they might even attempt to scale them up into their own institutions? That's a good question. And I think there's a couple things to note about, right? Is that uh, what's really interesting with the conversation we're having in right now in the broader ecosystem on CBDCs and Libra is that any bank CEO today needs to at least understand what is taking place right now, because whatever is happening in the space will have an impact, which was not necessarily the case in the early days of CBDC conversations. I mean, just to give you one example, uh, the, one of the big risks that actually a lot of policymakers are worried about central bank digital currencies is the risk that it may accelerate a bank run. So let, let me give a very simple example for your audience. Today, if I do, not, I do not trust the banks anymore, I can go physically to my ATM and try to withdraw all the money physically that I have and try to bring it in my apartment. There's obviously a physical limit to how I can do that. Um, and you know, for obvious reasons, it's not very practical. And the difference with a central bank digital currency is literally I can put move my, all my money literally in seconds on my iPhone. Right uh, in a digital wallet, and this is actually so. One of the big risks for now uh, bank leadership is that what well, in the event something like this happens, this may accelerate the bank run way faster than people waiting in queue and waiting for the limit of what they can withdraw physically, like that is often the case today. And this is why a lot of policymakers, when they're exploring CBDCs, many of them uh, have made it very clear that if a CBDC moves forward, there will be a limit to how much can be used by people. For example, the great, great example is the Dutch and the latest proposal where they, they, they recommend an amount that goes between three to 4,000 euros uh, that for people to be able to use. So it does not really impact monetary stability and financial stability, which is very important from that perspective. Uh, the other thing as well is for banks is their funding rates. Right now, when I deposit my good old money at the bank, um, the bank is able to use that. You know, we call this fractional banking, where they're able to lend it out and do other things with that money. And however, uh, you know, in a CBDC context, if I, I prefer to hold part of it in, 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 in my digital wallet, the bank obviously has less deposits. And what that means is for funding purposes, they have to go get funding somewhere else, which what in, in the industry we call this wholesale funding, which increases their funding rates and increases profitability of banks. So I think that's, that's one thing we have to keep in mind. And this is why, unlike other conversations on the future of money, this is something that I think uh, really has come also not on top of the agenda of policymakers, but that of leadership of banks as well. And I think that's very, very interesting and very important as well. Absolutely agreed. Michael, do you, do you see um, the People's Bank taking some of these design decisions to heart? I mean, it's been going on since 2014. It looks like a, a rapid deployment uh, post Libra's conversations about uh, globalized payments. What is driving the design theory behind uh, the DCP? Well, like I said in the beginning, it's uh, just to, to uh, replace the M0 money supply. They are uh, trying to basically create an alternative uh, backed by the central government. I mean, in China, it's a little bit of a different scene. We have a, a dominating uh, payment scene between WeChat and Alipay. Uh, and and uh, actually, because of digital commerce, there's a huge uh, online uh, you know, adoption in China by consumers. So already, you know, the, the country is largely cashless, right? Uh, that being said, we saw that as an important um, Functionality, perhaps even the United States. The United States issued this four trillion dollar plan. 
they have no ability to give the stimulus to individuals. I mean, they're sending out paper checks to everyone, to, to people who are dead, right? And, and, and so, uh, you know, it's not very efficient. Imagine a digital currency linked to a digital wallet, and the central bank can literally direct the deposit to every uh, social security citizen in the country. So those are very interesting, uh, you know, functionalities. One other uh, notable one is, uh, I think it's been clearly shown that stimulus money is not effectively used. It does not trickle down to the lower people. This, the, the people who have it, i.e. the banks and the corporations that have access to this easy cash, uh, don't really do things that are in benefit of the overall economy. So in the first uh, uh, financial crisis, global financial crisis, if we trace back the billions of dollars that were given to the banks and to industries like the airline industry, a vast preponderance of that money ended up in stock buybacks, right? Basically, the, the people who got access to the easy money use that to prop up their stock prices and to enrich themselves because they have the stock options as uh, you know uh, the, the leadership in those uh, companies. Basically, a financial accounting trick, but that money didn't actually go to uh, you know, fragile SMEs to stimulate the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, um, there is the possibility now with programmable money that you can actually literally program in and stipulate where this money could go. And there's a much more fine grain control that the central bank could have. So these are, you know, I would say quite disruptive uh, concepts. It's going to take years and years before, uh, say, the People's Bank of China or other countries uh, can really wrap their heads around, do the simulations, do the economic uh, modeling to see how this would affect the economy. But I think in general, having these tools overall uh, will, will benefit society in some form to have that flexibility. Absolutely. Agreed. Um, so I want to kind of shift gears a little bit here and start to talk a little bit about how the competitive side of a, of a central bank uh, digital currency issuance could could create conflict. I mean, uh, interoperability is a wonderful concept. And, and we know that I think the world would love to be very nice to each other when it comes to finance. But as we see the central banks jockeying for control, I mean, we, we, we already stand, or understand that the dollar is dominant in global uh, economics. Is there an opportunity for China to come and challenge that dominance with their central bank digital issuance? Or is this a, a, a part of their continued mo uh, modernization attempt? Is, is this the leapfrog opportunity that we're, that we're witnessing right now? Um, and let's start with you, Douglas, and, and feel free to just go around clockwise. And I want to get all of your thoughts here before we wrap up on that. Yeah, you know, I think there are a number of different ways this can go, but certainly um, what we are seeing is with more and more countries engaging in CBDC projects, one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest opportunities going forward is going to be the interconnections between those different systems. Uh, and, you know, in some economies, the CBDC will be competing with a range of other types of monetary and payment instruments. I think if we look at the digital dollar proposals in the US, you're still imagining a cash-based system, you're imagining traditional payment system. The digital dollar system is not meant to sort of replace everything as an underlying infrastructure. Where, as if we think of the, the Chinese sort of structure, the idea is eventually that it will be uh, not having competition in the context of monetary functions, that it will be an interlinking monetary instrument across all of the, in many ways, currently, non-interoperable domestic payment systems in China. And so one of our questions is domestic interoperability, but also internationally. And that kind of depends. And if we think of uh, the Chinese proposal at the moment, it is largely limited to operating within the context of the borders, the physical electronic borders. But one can imagine how in the context of those electronic borders, if one integrates the system with, say, the RMB swap lines that are already engaged in a range of different countries, that sort of RMB electronic area can be expanded outside. Now, another way would be that you could actually allow the tokens to be used and circulate freely outside of the Chinese internet or blockchain or payment system environment. But as Michael highlighted, that raises real questions from the standpoint of monetary policy, from the standpoint of capital flows and the like. So I think at the moment, we're looking at something which is not necessarily being posited as a direct competitor. But what I think we are seeing discussions around, and I think we have to differentiate here between two classes of countries or central banks. 
major economies, major currency issuing central banks. And that's basically the Federal Reserve, People's Bank of China, European Central Bank. Those are your major country, major currency central banks. Those are different animals than everything else. What Canada or Sweden or the UK or Singapore or Australia or Saudi Arabia may do is all really interesting and nice. But the rest of the world is not potentially going to be adopting that in the context of large scale economic or financial transactions. So. There is definitely an element of potential geopolitical, not necessarily competition, but potentially alternatives or even fragmentation going forward. Absolutely. Henry, do you have any last thoughts on that point? Yeah, no, it's, it's, I totally agree with a lot of the comments that Douglas meant. Uh, I mean, a couple of things I would mention is that I really believe that, you know, we've had the race of space, we had the race to technology. Now we're definitely having this race to the future of money. And I think arguably, and I think many of us would argue in the ecosystem that China, as Michael pointed out, has been looking at this since 2014 and Asia, in particular China, is way ahead of everyone else uh, on this particular topic. And I think on, on the global perspective, just to add to what Douglas was mentioning, I think we're, we, we're going to have, I think, there's, there's debates, not only between policymakers, but really trickle down to people. Uh, because I think we're going to have this debate between, first, privacy. You know, one of the great things with central bank digital currency is actually from a policymaker perspective, you can see the impact of your activity, but also you see the transactions. So I think as an individual, uh, do I want all my transactions to be public? I think all of us, maybe the beauty of cash is I can make certain purchases without my wife seeing it or vice versa, right? I think there's a lot Anonymity. of these things that people are forget uh, the anonymity element. And to be fair, that's being discussed in certain CBDC proposals that are being put into place. But I think that's one thing to need, we need to have. And the second one, as a, I think the discussion we need to have, is really some of the problems that it's going to solve. We discussed financial inclusion before, but another one is like money laundering. I really mm -hmm. believe that the first, the real the CBDCs will give us a real, for the first time, a fighting chance against money laundering and corruption. Uh, because obviously, on a CBDC perspective, you can tra trace them. And I think that's going to be very interesting to see how that uh, uh, evolves over the next couple, couple of weeks and months. And really, I think the catalyst for all this, you know, that's really makes it very exciting is, uh, is COVID-19. Obviously, COVID-19 has had a, a devastating impact on many, many sectors of the economy and society. Ironically, on this particular topic, I think it's acting as a catalyst, not only because people are afraid to touch money because of the risk it can transmit the virus, uh, not only because, ironically, it's happening, like the Bitcoin halving that happened a couple of weeks ago, it's happening literally at the same time we're having records number of, of uh, quantitative easing, but also as we are seeing some of the direct um, uh, gaps in the current system, as Michael pointed out, right now the U.S. government is sending 100 million checks, checks to people to be able to get it. And ironically, what we're having now one phenomenon is we're seeing that we haven't seen, not only since the GFC, but since the Great Depression, we're seeing towns and cities start issuing their own currency. I'm talking about it actually in my newsletter this week, uh, just to be able to give access to their local ecosystem in, in, the, in, the, in, in their community or little town. And this, for me, shows that there's a problem. And thankfully, we have from a technological problem, uh, perspective, we're, we have a solution. From policymaker perspective, we're getting there. And I think that's very exciting when it comes to the future of money which impacts the future of society, future of finance. And that's very exciting from that perspective. Absolutely. Fantastic, guys. Well, I, I very much appreciate your time and expertise. I think that's all the time we have for today. But, I mean, there's so much more going on with central bank digital currencies that the rest of 2020, I'm sure, is going to be jam-packed with a lot of exciting uh, additions and, and news. So we'll, we'll have to have another conversation, I'm sure. Uh, but I appreciate your time again, and thank you so much. That's going to do it for the DCEP Unitized Decentralized Panel. Thanks for watching. Thanks for having Thank us. You.